Susan, thank you for joining us and your willingness to be our first person today. Um, we have so, you have so much to share with us that we're going to start right away, I think. Just jump into it if we can. Your early years were living in the town of Bad Kreuzna uh, with your family. Before we turn to the events of Kristallnacht and the events that followed after that, tell us first about your community, your parents, and about you in those early years of your life. Well... Uh, in 1933, when Hitler first came into power, I was a very small child. My father had a thriving business store. He had a linen store, and he was making a good life uh, for our family, and I was a very happy child. And then, all of a sudden, when the Nazis came into power, they boycotted my father's store, and so he... Didn't, wasn't able to make a living for us, and we had to move from one place to the other. When your father lost his business, what did he do <clears throat> then to, to make ends meet, to provide for his family? Well, um, the only thing that he really knew was how to sell things, so he got together with a farmer who was growing berries, strawberries and blueberries and raspberries, and he used to go with these baskets, filled his baskets, and he went to the people in the Jewish community, and they bought the uh, berries from him. So there was quite a big difference between what he had, the income he had. Absolutely. Before, yes. You, you shared with me that you would know when he had had a good day of selling his berries. He'd come home and smile and you just you just knew that he had had a good day yes yes you um before we turn to some of the moves you made um you told me that you were you were unhappy in your early school years yes why was that yeah um i think the audience saw the little girl with that cone right. um, all the children in germany when they first went to public school uh they got one of those cones and it was filled with candy and uh so that was my first day, the picture that you saw, that everybody saw. That was your first day yeah. of school. Yeah. So I was really very excited, mm -hmm. and I was very happy, but not for very long, because um, the kids started to make fun of me, and they started to bully me. And this is, I'm in first grade, I'm in this little kid, and I don't know about anti-Semitism, I don't know about hatred. Mm -hmm. And the teachers was reading a book to the children called Der Giftpilz, which means a poison mushroom. And um, the kids were learning from the teacher that Jews were poison mushrooms. And then the children just continued to make fun of me, and the teacher certainly wasn't understanding towards me. And so I used to go home. Uh, every day and tell my mother I didn't want to go to school anymore. And one day I was extremely happy. And the reason for this was, is there was a law in Germany that Jewish children weren't allowed to go to public school anymore. Mm. So I was happy. I you were happy, to to yeah. <laughs> yes. So then you ended up going to a Jewish school. Yes, because... Uh, the Jewish community wanted their children to have an education. So we had uh, a one-room schoolhouse, and uh, the teacher, we had one teacher, and he taught all the grades from the first grade to the 10th grade, and he taught, taught us all of our subjects. In that one room? In that one I room. I remember you shared with me the first time we talked about it, the first graders or the little kids were in one first row, and then it just went from there, right. a few rows. Yes, yes. It's like first, the first grade, second grade, third grade, and tenth grade is the tenth row, and right. all of those children. He taught us history, he taught us geography, he taught us how to read and how to write. Mm. I mean, I, I, I was a teacher later on, I don't know how that man did it, but, he, but, but we were all happy because we were not bullied and we were not discriminated. You, you also shared with me an incident um, uh, when your mother had sent you to a local store to buy bread. Oh, yeah. Will you tell us about that? Uh, we had, 
pretend this is our house. And then all of the audience here is a beautiful garden, a park with flowers. I can see that. flowers in it. And then at the very end where, we came, where they first came in <coughs> was a street. And that was the place where all the markets were, all the stores were. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't know. Just Thank let me finish. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So... Uh, and in order for me to get to the market, I had to walk down the steps and walk through the park and get to the other end of the park mm -hmm. to buy the groceries my mother wanted me to buy. And I remember I was a very little kid, maybe I was seven. And um, one day I went, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I went down the steps and started to walk in the park and the gatekeeper of the park came, and he said to me in a very ugly way that I wasn't allowed to walk through that park anymore because I was Jewish. And he said, don't you dare, and then he called me some nasty names. Mm -hmm. So uh, I ran home and I told my mother, and she told me not to walk through that park again. So um, the next time my mother told me to buy a loaf of bread and I was very excited, she put the German money in my hand and I'm really proud because I'm doing something for my family. And I get over there to the steps and I say to myself, mm, if I have to go to the store and if I can't go through the park, I have to walk like one block this way, and then another big block this way, and then go around mm -hmm. again. And so I was standing at the steps there, and I said to myself, I think I'm very tired. So I, uh, I'm sure the audience already knows what I decided. I think so. So anyway, I got to the bottom of the steps, and of course the gatekeeper came, and he saw me. And he uh, threw rocks at me this time and called me all kinds of horrible names. But the most horrible thing was he had a daughter, and she was maybe, um, maybe she was uh, ten, seventh grader. Is anybody here a seventh grade? Something like that. It was a seventh grader. And she saw her dad. She saw her dad. Um, throwing stones. Throwing the stones uh, at me, and she heard him say all these horrible things to me, and he was her role model. And uh, so she said, well, well if, this, if, if my father is doing this, I must do it too. And so here was this young girl learning about hatred right. and anti-Semitism from her father. I never walked through that park again. I'm sure of that. Um, you started to share with us that you had this, as things got tougher for your family economically and, and, and because of the anti-Semitism. You had to move from place to place. Yes. Where did you end up living um, at that time? Uh, well, we, we were living in very many different houses and the picture that the audience saw where my brother and I were sitting on the steps, right, step. um, that was not the last house, it was a, that wasn't the last house we lived in, but it, but the houses were economically smaller and smaller. But we were sitting outside on the steps there because um, my mother was going to have the baby, the baby that you saw, and her name was the one that was sitting on my mother's lap. And uh, she was having the baby. And the reason she was having the baby at home and my brother and I were sitting outside is because... Um, Jewish ladies weren't allowed to go to the hospital. And so she had the baby in the house. So had, she had no choice. She had to have it at home. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. And then after that, we moved one more time, yes. And that was when you ended up at a place called Adolf Hitler Platz, Adolf, right? Yes, Adolf Hitler Platz. Yeah. And now that place is still there, but it's not called Adolf Hitler right, Platz right, anymore. Right. Yes. And you, when you moved there, you were living... Um, in a home, that, and this is significant in a little bit, with a rabbi and his family in, yes. in that home. Yes, it was a building that we lived on the first floor. The rabbi lived on the second floor, mm -hmm. and a non-Jewish family lived on the third floor. And uh, there was an attic at the very top. 
And this, this of course, brings us to that, that terrible night of November 9th through 10th, 1938, yes. the night that we now call Kristallnacht, or the yes. night of broken glass. Yes. Tell us what you remember about that yes. night. Uh, my brother and I, the, not the baby, but my, the Joe, the one that was on that on side, and I'm room. on this side, uh, we were sleeping in our bedroom, and we were very excited because the next day was the 10th of November, which was my mother's birthday, and we were, couldn't fall asleep. And anyway, around 11 o'clock, some bricks and rocks were being thrown through our bedroom window. And I was very frightened, and I covered myself up with the blanket, but my brother, who's a year younger than I am, he was very curious, and he wanted to find out what was going on. So he lifted himself up, of the ledge and he looked out the window and he said to me, Susie, it is our neighbors that are, that are throwing the rocks. the rocks and bricks through the window. And the civil policeman, he was, he was standing like this, um, the civil policeman was standing on the outskirts of the, of the group that was doing all of this and he didn't stop them at all. And so we were very frightened. Mm -hmm. So we ran across the hall to our parents' bedroom where the baby and my parents were sleeping. And the baby was just a little baby then. And he was in his crib and a rock fell on his hand. This is my brother Ernest. And a uh, rock fell on his hand, but he didn't get hurt, so he was okay. Mm -hmm. But while we were all huddling together, deciding what we should do, um, some people had uprooted a lamppost uh, on Adolf Hitler Platz, and they carried it on their shoulders, and they came to our front door, which was made out of glass, out of blue, red, and beautiful mm -hmm. green gl glass, and they smashed that lamppost uh, through our front door, and the, I, I still remember all of the... Um, glass falling and shattering all over. And uh, it was really very frightening. And so my father said, let's go hide up in the attic. Mm -hmm. Is there something wrong with No, you? no, 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 yeah. keep going. <laughs> I heard a noise. Uh, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I think people can hear us pretty okay. well, yeah. Um, um, so so we, we, my father said, let's go hide up in the attic. Mm -hmm. And so um, we rushed up to the attic, and there was uh, the rabbi's family who lived on the second floor was already up there, but not the rabbi. And they had this little window um, in the attic, and it was like this, and I looked through the window, and I saw that the rabbi, he was standing on his balcony. He was the only person in the town who had a balcony, and he was standing uh, uh, on the balcony, and two SS officers had him standing like this, um, and they were holding him like this, one here and one here, and another one came and cut off his beard. And at that time, a beard was a status symbol for a rabbi. Mm -hmm. So, um, And you saw that. Yes, saw I saw that. that. And so then later on, I found out that they put him in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, I found out that they looted his apartment and my, ours. And later on, I found out that they didn't only do that to our apartment, but they did it to every Jewish family in our town, and that they burned down our synagogue. And there were still some Jewish stores left. They had been boycotted, but the Jewish people bought from them. So they eked out a living for a little while, but those uh, um, stores were looted and glass was broken. And uh, I found out that this burning of the synagogues and this looting of the stores and, 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 and doing these horrible things to people's families not only happened in our town of Bad Kreisner, but it happened 
in every town in Germany where there was a Jewish community. Also happened in Austria on that night, both Germany and Austria. Yeah. In fact, on that night, over 300 synagogues were burned across Germany. Yeah. So you're, you're in the attic, the rabbi was taken away. On that night, I believe 30,000 Jewish men across Germany were rounded up and arrested. Your father was not that night. Yeah. Why, why no, my father was, was, I think my, because he wasn't up in the attic, but the way I remember it, and the way I've discussed it with my brother Joe, mm -hmm. uh, my father wasn't up in the attic when we first were there, but he came the day later. Mm -hmm. And what we think happened is he used to play chess with the mayor of the town and maybe the mayor of the town was his friend and he let him go, mm -hmm. but uh, we're not sure. And then he came up to the attic and he was with us. Or because maybe he, because he was Polish and at that time they hadn't invaded Poland yet. Mm -hmm. And this is just a theory, we don't know. Don't know. And because maybe they were worried <laughs> because he was, of a, he was not a German Jew, he was Polish, maybe they didn't want to put him in, mm -hmm. in the concentration camps at that time. So there you are in the attic. And you spent, you spent a significant amount of time up yeah. in that attic. Yeah, I don't remember how many days. Yeah. I don't remember. But we, there were apples up in that attic, and the rabbi's children uh, were with us, and we played with the apples, and we ate the apples. That was our food. That and we food, ate yeah. the apples, yes. Before we, before we move, um, on from there, tell us about your father, what, what little money he had. Um, he needed to hide that cash. Well, I wasn't going to tell you that oh. story. <laughs> well, forgive me, audience, for telling that story, but my father did have a little bit of money left over, mm -hmm. and uh, he couldn't keep it in the bank because didn't know whether he was ever going to be able to get it back out. And so he had hidden it maybe under the mattress in his bedroom. And so he wanted it to be safe, so he took the money out and he asked me to put it in my underwear and I was wearing it in my underwear. That, that was yeah. where he hid it, yeah. Yeah, that's where he hid it. And, uh, and I want to tell you something, we didn't have a bathroom up there. The money got very wet mm -hmm. that time. <laughs> The, <laughs> of course, the events of that night, Kristallnacht, that led your parents to make this profound decision to get out of Germany. Yes. Um, tell us what happened from there yes. about their decision to yeah. leave Germany, find a sanctuary for yeah. you. Yeah, up until the night of the broken glass, um, many Jews at that time felt they needed to get out of Germany. But there are a lot of Jews also felt, well, maybe Nazism and Hitler is going to blow over and everything is going to be all right. And that's how it was in my family. My mother always wanted to come to the United States, which was the greatest country in the world. And my father was reticent about it because um, he uh, said maybe it will blow over. But after the night of the broken glass, everybody wanted to leave. And of course, there were lots of immigration laws here in the United States. And uh, it wasn't easy to come to the United States. You had to have affidavits and papers. And you had to have somebody to sponsor you in the United States. And, that, and they said you, they'd be responsible for you. So the paperwork was unimaginable. So what my father decided to do is he had heard of this lady who was taking children across the border to France, and she was doing it not out of the goodness of her heart, but she was doing it for money. So all that money that had dried up, mm -hmm. he gave to this lady so she would take us, smuggle us. Across the border into across France. Across the border into yeah. France, yes. And she had two children of her own, and I think what she might have done is taken the kids' pictures off and put our pictures on. I'm not sure, I don't remember right. any details, because right. I was a little kid, so. Don't. But you do remember going with her. Oh, yes, I do remember. Do you, do you recall when your parents said, we're gonna send our little, our little girl and our little boy, uh, not, not, the, not the infant, but yeah, you not and the Joseph, baby. we're gonna send them 
away uh, to another country. Do, do you remember what that felt like for yeah. you? Yeah, that's, that's a very sad question. I feel, worse, when I think about it, I feel badly for my parents. Right. Can you imagine yeah. having a mother and father having to take their children away and, 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 and not knowing whether they were ever going right. to see them again? But I guess they had to make a choice mm -hmm. whether they wanted their kids to be safe and, and, and stay alive. And, but, but for me, it wasn't so terrible because I didn't know. I thought they'd come to France in two weeks. Or so you expected to see yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But I was, I was scared. I mm -hmm. was scared. And how I felt, I have put it like in the back of my mind right. and don't want to think about yeah. it. That. Tell us about, there was one incident that you do remember on the train as you were making your way to, to Paris where um, German soldiers boarded the train. Well, well, she had told us to pretend we were sleeping because, of course, my brother and I didn't know how to speak any French. Right. And she was and, a French woman, right? And she yeah. was a French yeah. woman, and so um, the, when the French police or whatever, the people who were in charge of looking at passports, if they had talked to us, they would have known we were not French children. Mm -hmm. So we had to be very quiet, but evidently we did a good job pretending to be asleep and we got safely across the border and she took us to Paris. And what, what was waiting for you in Paris? Well, my father had a third cousin. We called him uncle, mm -hmm. uncle, uh, Heinrich, we called him. And, uh, and he was living in Paris. Yeah, he was a young man, let's see, young man, maybe he was like young, handsome man like you, you know, maybe. <laughs> I think, no, he was a young man, I yeah, think, yeah. yeah. Anyway, me. so he, he took care of us in his hotel. Mm -hmm. He wasn't married and he didn't have any children. Mm -hmm. And he took care of us in his hotel and he told us to stay in the hotel. And... Um, so he we used to go to work and he used to say to us, stay in the hotel until I get back. Of course, my brother is the curious one. And he was like seven and a half, mm -hmm. maybe seven and three quarters. And he used to sneak out of the hotel and go on the metro in Paris and sneak under the styles and go all over Paris and come back um, before the uncle came back home from mm. work. And I always stayed home because I always listened. I was always- You were a good girl. girl. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so at some point though, um, he, he was unable to take care of you. Yes. So what did he do then? Well, he tried to get in touch with my parents mm. and he tried to get in touch with Jewish organizations, and one of the organizations that you already mentioned, mm -hmm. the Hayas, and there also was an organization called OSE, called Au Secours des Enfants, and they looked out for children that were lost or didn't have any place to go. So in the environs, there was this little village of in the, right around Paris, and there was this foster home, and we stayed there. Is that the place that you were really truly treated badly? Oh yeah, we, we, we were treated badly, but we um, told this uncle that this lady was not good to the children, and uh, he put us in a different one. And before you went to the, the different one, the better one, the place that you were, if I remember right, uh, you were not allowed to be indoors except to sleep at night. Um, you slept on the floor. Oh, oh, you mean that was the first one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was just, Madame Zelitsky was her name, yeah. I remember, yes. But I don't talk about her okay. anymore because I have forgotten about that lady. Okay. I remember in the second foster home we went to, and that was there a, were two ladies and they were very good to us and we yeah. went to the French school in the village and mm -hmm. we learned how to speak French and so we were really good at it. Mm -hmm. You know, kids learn how to, if you don't know how to speak the language, you learn it in a big hurry. In a big hurry. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you know whether at that time your parents were able to 
uh, keep track of you at that point? Do you know? No, the thing is, we wrote to them all the time, but we didn't hear from them, so we didn't know what was happening to them. This, this was quite a, a long period of time. So in, in May of 1940, of course, Germany then, they had, they had attacked Poland in September 1939, starting World War II, but the following spring, May of 1940, Germany attacked a number of countries, including France. Yes. So there you are in Paris. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, I remember it very well. Why we were in the city, I don't quite remember, but I was there when they knew, when they, everybody knew that the, the German army was invading Paris, and the people in Paris were really very frightened. Yeah. And not only Jewish people, but many, many people, and they wanted to run out of Paris. And, uh, and there was this mass exodus out yes, of Paris. Yes, yeah. yes. And they either wanted to go to the unoccupied, or they wanted to go to Vichy, or they wanted to go to Versailles, where, the, where there's a palace. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I can remember the boots, the sounding of the boots, and the caravan of the German army coming into Paris. Mm -hmm. And it was, I remember the sound of it. And so how we got to Versailles, which is like 40 minutes west of Paris, how we got there, I don't know. Some people walked, some people took the train, some people rode on bicycles, some people went on cars. I think two nuns found us and they just took us. Found to you the, and your brother. Yeah, and they took us to Versailles. And so we got to Versailles. <coughs> So there you are in Versailles, um, and you've got to you got to find a place to stay. So tell us what happened. Yes. Okay. Well, you all know there's a big palace called Versailles, and in so of course all of the people uh, wanted to go there because that was the biggest lodging they would be able to find. And so the mayor of the town was really. Up, uh, he didn't know what he was going to do with all these people. So he um, said, well, wh where am I going to house them? What am I going to do with them? Where are they going to sleep? So we all got a, a burlap sack. And then uh, um, in, the, in the, the Versailles, the palace has these beautiful gardens. And at the end of the gardens, there was a big pile of hay. And so they gave us a the burlap sack and a little string, and we filled up the burlap sack with hay, and then we tied it, and then we had a mattress. Mm. So then we went back to the palace, and the biggest room in the palace, of course, does anybody in the audience know what it is? Yeah, well, somebody said it. Somebody said it. Yeah, the Hall of Mirrors. Yeah. And um, it is the Hall of Mirrors, and it, the, the hall, it, and they had, it had chandeliers on both sides. And then they, we all laid our mattresses next to each other, and we slept there. I don't know what we did for food, but I remember sleeping, and I remember the hay sticking in my back and... and, and Through a burlap bag. Yeah. <laughs> and it, of course, it wasn't long before the Germans arrived. Yes, and it, yes, there's a story. They didn't, they didn't stay in Paris. They went all over right. France, and, and, the, and it was easy for them to get to Versailles. And then again, I was this little girl, and I heard the sound, the same sound of the marching of the caravan of the German army coming into the town. And so the first thing that they did, they went to the, uh, to the palace. And uh, I, I saw from the window of the palace a German officer. I don't know whether he was a general or whether he was something else. Got out of the car. It was like, it wasn't a car, it was a jeep. Jeep. And he got out of the jeep, and he said he wanted to speak to the mayor of the town. So the mayor of the town knew only how to speak French, and the German officer only knew how to speak German. And so they needed to talk to each other, and so somebody said, 
Oh, there's a little girl in the palace. She knows how to speak German. No, guess who it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so it was me. So I came out and I was really frightened because I was frightened about Nazis and Germans. And uh, they can just, I mean, we can all just imagine your little girl standing there and there's a, a German officer with the, tower, with the boots all the way up to you, you. towering. That's yeah. exactly right. right. He was towering over me and, and all I could see were these boots. And when you go, how many of you been to the permanent exhibit? How many are going? There. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> so um, you'll see the German officers and they're wearing these high boots. And um, uh, so they started talking to each other and evidently I translated, um, Okay, and then uh, the conversation was over and the Nazi over, bent over me and he said to me, hey little girl, how come you know how to speak German so well? So I said to him, you know, the French schools are very good and I learned how to speak <laughs> German. That was incredibly quick, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So from there you would, you would eventually find your way to another place, I'm, I'm not gonna say it right, but Chateau du Marais. Yes. Tell us what that, how you got there, if you know, and then what, what happened to you once you got there. Okay. okay. Uh, when, the, when the Germans took over France, they divided it, mm -hmm. this is, pretend this is France, and all of this part right here, down here, was the unoccupied zone. They told the French people that they that they could live there and they wouldn't have to wouldn't have to be part of the Nazi government. So everybody wanted to go to that unoccupied zone. And so there was this Chateau de Morel. I might just add for our audience that even though it was the unoccupied zone, the, the government in charge there, Vichy government was fully collaborative with them. Yes, the, Pétain, the Nazis. Was, the right. Pétain was the head of that. Absolutely. Uh, yes. So, um, so we went uh, to the unoccupied zone, and there was, uh, uh, I was telling you before about the OSE, mm -hmm. this, this organization. They had different homes for children all over France, and there was this one in the unoccupied zone in a little village called Brouvernay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we ended up in this little village and there was this home for children, lost children from all over, and we were safe there. What, what do you remember about being in that home? Hmm. We went to school, but I remember uh, the town had a public school, but they didn't want and these were all farmers, and, but they didn't want these Jewish children to rub elbows with their kids. Mm -hmm. And they were there, so they said, well, we'll provide a teacher and a one-room schoolhouse for them, f for the Jewish children. So I, at the time, or maybe now, I don't know if I realized it at the time, the, the farmer's children had so much to give to us, and we had so much to give to them because you know we had been urban children and we had seen all kinds of things in their life. But it was so strange that those people were anti-Semitic too mm -hmm. and they didn't want their kids to be anywhere near the Jewish children. But the teacher was wonderful. Later on in my adult life, I found out that that teacher became the mayor of a town in France, but he was very good to us. He was and, good to you. Yes, and he taught us a lot of geography of France and history of France, and it was good. One of the really, I thought, very, very uh, poignant things you shared with me uh, was, you know, you, you, you were, you were you know, refugee kids. You didn't have anything, but you celebrated, you found a way to celebrate each other's birthdays. Oh, I forgot, I haven't talked about that in a long would time. You, would, you, would you talk about that? Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't have so much wonderful food. So, but we did every once in a while, once, once a week or maybe twice a week, we got dessert and it was a little piece like this. Maybe it was a candy or a, or a, cho a piece of chocolate mm -hmm. cake or something like that. And so before it was somebody's birthday, 
the friends of the birthday child used to save their dessert and then we did in the in the kitchen they had like trays like they have in the cafeteria where kids go mm -hmm. to school in the cafeteria and they they got a tray from the cafeteria and they hid all of the they saved it for a few weeks and they and then they found some kind of a made doilies out of paper mm -hmm. and they covered it up with the trays up with this doily and everybody put all of the they're saved up little yes. desserts yeah and put it and then on the morning when it was the girl when that was the person's birthday they carried the tray to the bed and woke the person up and said happy birthday and then they mm -hmm. gave them the tray well thanks for thanks for telling that again yes so there you are in this children's home in southern france not knowing anything about the fate of the rest of your family and then one day you do learn that your parents are trying to, to get, get you out and to them. Uh, tell us what happened to you from there. Your parents know where you are now. They want to get you out of there. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was um, so doing my homework or something, and the directories was a lady. She was the director of this children's home. She called me to her office, and I was really very frightened because you only went there <clears throat> when we were bad. You know? mm -hmm. And I said, maybe they made a mistake, and my brother, they should have called him. <laughs> so, so I went up there, and I, I remember there was a staircase, and it was a marble staircase, and I went into her office, and it was made of wood all around, and I'm scared, and I'm going in there, and she said to me, Zuzi, you're going to go to the United States. And so I was really very surprised, and what I found out later, that my parents had gotten to the United States. This is a very complicated story. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just tell the audience something? Yeah, absolutely, whatever you want uh, to tell them. I just want to give you, um, and you, I know you, I'm going to tell you a little bit later what to look for in a permanent exhibit, but if you get a chance to look at our special exhibit that we have here, which is called uh, Americans and the Holocaust, uh, there in that particular exhibit, it shows you uh, the problems the people the people had to come to the United States, and um, um, you had to have affidavits, you had to have papers, you had to have passports, you had to have written permission from the United States government, and you had to have a sponsor here in the United States to say that they would provide for you so that you would not be an economic burden. Mm -hmm. So what had happened, and this is all in that, in that particular exhibit, if you have time to go see it or if you don't have a ticket to go to the PE, you might want to go there. Anyway, so what happened is my father had a cousin who had a pickle factory in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted to send the affidavits to our whole family, but it wasn't enough. They weren't rich enough to cover all of the expenses. So the United States government said, you can have one affidavit, you can have one visa. So what happened is my, they decided that my father should come here and then work and then get my mother and the baby brother that you saw in that picture. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, after they got here, they went to the HIAS, which was another organization, mm -hmm. and the Quakers, and they helped them look for us in wherever we were. And those two organizations found us in the Chateau de Morel, mm -hmm. and they helped go right to the State Department and right to all of these different people, and finally, they were able to get us the visas to for my brother and me to get over here. And you're, if, if I remember right, your father, when he came, then he went to work, found a job, then he was able to generate enough money to bring my your mother. mother over and your baby brother. Exactly. I, I might just mention to the audience before we talk about you coming to the United States that um, the Allies uh, landed in North Africa in, November, in 1942 and when that happened, the Germans then occupied all of France 
And so your ability to get out wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible um, the next year. So you, you were able to get out. And tell us about coming to the United States. So there you are. You've got to get from France. You've got to get to the U.S. Yeah. So Eleanor Roosevelt, and you'll see that in that Americans in the Holocaust also. Eleanor Roosevelt, she was um, um, pushing her husband to see if they couldn't bring 10,000 children to the United States without all of that visa business and everything. Mm -hmm. She encouraged him to sign a bill that was, um, I'm just telling you this a little bit of history so you can understand, mm -hmm. uh, to sign this bill. Uh, I, we're taking too much No, you know, you're, you're good. I'm just keeping an eye on it. Okay. Um, to sign this bill, and she said, sign this bill, and he said he couldn't do it because we had to take care of the children here in the United States. So later on, she became... Uh, she worked very hard to get children over here. She was in charge of a committee. This 10,000 children never happened. Never the happened. bill didn't get signed. And you would see that in that exhibit. Anyway, so, um, so later on, she was in charge of this committee of bringing some children. And this was in 1941. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were still giving out visas in 1941, the United States mm -hmm. government. And this is like in September of 1941. Uh, ask me the question again. You, you, you had to get to Portugal first. Yes. You know, once you had all the paperwork you needed. And yes. You were, your parents had sent the tickets. I think they sent tickets that never made it, and they had to resend them. Yes. But you, you got to Portugal. Yes, we went to, we went to Marseille, which is like south, and then we went on the train through the Pyrenees, and a lot of Jews later on, you know, got saved because they went through the Pyrenees and ended up in Portugal. Mm -hmm. And there was a ship called the Sapa Pinto, and uh, there, there was a ship, and in the hull of that ship, 50 children that Eleanor Roosevelt worked very hard with her committee mm -hmm. were in, in that one area of the ship. Fifty children. Fifty yeah. children. And, and as I recall, you were not allowed, because there was also tourists on that boat. Yes. Because Portugal, well, was... Portugal was a neutral country, so shipping was able to go out of Portugal. You weren't allowed to mingle with them. Yeah, we weren't allowed. To. It was a cruise ship, but it wasn't anything like the cruise right, ships right, that right, we have right. today. It was much smaller. But my brother did anyway. You know, we were, he mingled. He been, I stayed with the 50 kids and stayed in the hall at the big was the not. front of the no he discovered a, a, a closet or some kind of a place where they where they had stored pineapple and uh, we had never eaten any pineapple in our life and he had never eaten anything so good in his life and so he, ate and ate the pineapple and many times, and the ship took 14 days to get to the United mm -hmm. States and the, and the Atlantic Ocean was going like this. So my brother had to spend a lot of time over the railing and some of the insides of his body came into the Atlantic Ocean. So, um, and so, he was all was very nervous about coming. Mm -hmm. He was excited about coming. And can I tell you this part? It's embarrassing to tell the audience. And you have to promise not to tell my brother ever. <laughs> because he sees it differently than I do. He used to wet his bed at night. And he got this terrible rash on his body. Mm -hmm. Because the acid from, from the pineapple. pineapple uh, gave him, made him, made him really rash, very big, serious rash. So when we got, when we got um, close to the United States, they told us that at six o'clock the next morning we would be passing this Statue of Liberty, and um, so all the kids, of course, were excited because it meant democracy. It meant. It meant that we were going to, my brother and I, we were going to see our parents. So we got up really early. And when we got up to the deck, there's this big fog. Mm -hmm. And 
you could you can you couldn't see this and so we were really upset but it was a little bit earlier than 6 but i'm telling you at exactly 6 o'clock that fog lifted like this like a curtain in the theater it didn't open up like this but it lifted up like this and we could slowly see the statue of liberty just appear right in front that of gives us. me goosebumps yeah. 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 It's, it gives me goosebumps every time I yeah. talk about wow. it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so we saw it, and all the children were very happy. And so then we, we got to New York, and that picture you saw, on the uh, ship. Yep. Um, and all the passengers went off, but the 50 kids had to get inspected by some doctors to figure out if we had some kind of infectious disease. Mm -hmm. And when they, all the kids passed, but when they got to my brother, he had this rash. And so I told them what the rash was all about, but they wouldn't listen to this little girl. So um, they said, he can't come to the United States. Keep going. <laughs> so I'm sure the audience already knows what happened. Usually when I talk to high school kids, you know, they guess, oh, they made you go back to Germany, and of course that's not correct. There is a place right next to the Statue of Liberty, which is called Ellis Island, and that's where they take people uh, to quarantine them in, in those days. Now it's a museum, of course. And so, 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 and your parents are on the shore waiting for you. Yes, and we couldn't, so we went to Ellis Island, and there, my brother got better, they put cream on him. But we learned everything about the United States in that place. They had these big tables, and on the tables were these slices of white bread. And we took them, and we took it in our hand. It was white. We had never seen white bread before. And it was white, and we could crush it in our hands and make little balls out of it. And then we would eat it. And they told us it was called Wonder Bread. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the other thing I learned is there was a sailor sitting next to my brother when we were eating. And he was drinking this bubbly drink. and. Uh, it was brown and had bubbles in it. And so I told my brother to take a taste. And so my brother looked at me and he said, should I drink it? And I figured, well, I'll try it. And he said, oh, it's very good. And then the sailor told him that it was Coca-Cola. So, and then one more thing, we found out that children in the United States could have candy that would keep, you could keep in your mouth for a whole day and it wouldn't melt. And of course we learned that it was chewing gum. So we were ready. <laughs> and, and, but, but even, despite knowing all that about the United States, you had to go to American, be Americanized. And so you had to go to school. So tell us what that was like for you before we, we, we break and turn to our audience for a couple of questions. So you, you had to go to American school. Yeah, we went to go Americanization school for a few weeks to learn how to speak English. And then we went to the public school. Do you want me to talk about that? If you would like. Okay. Uh, I don't know, I can't see how many kids are here, but the schools were different in those days. The teachers didn't understand anything about immigrant children. And they, what they had done is they had divided um, you know, like not homo they had not heterogeneous grouping where everybody's in the same room. But in those days, they put me in, um, in uh, junior high school, which is not middle school, in seventh grade. And they had 7B1, 7B2, 7B3, 7B4, and 7B5, and 7B6. And 7B1 were all the kids that had that were dumb, they had learning problems, and all the kids in 7B5 were all the smart ones. So guess where they'd put me? Mm -hmm. Yes, 7B1. And there they had all of the problem kids, and the kids, some of the kids didn't do their homework, and some of the kids 
chewed gum and that was not allowed. I couldn't believe it. And a couple of the kids slept, fell asleep in the classroom and I couldn't believe it. But those were all the problem kids and mm -hmm. that's where they put me because I didn't know how to speak any English. But when I learned how to speak English a little bit, I got to 7B2, 3 and 4, but I never got over You never it. got to the end no, of that? No, no, no. <laughs> So, two more questions for you, Susan. Um, one, do you recall what it was like for you to be reunited with your mom and dad? What that was like, have, having been away from them for so long when you got here? Is it something you recall as profound or just you had to move on with life? We'll move on from there. Yeah. Okay, okay, we'll move on from there. Of your extended family, did others survive? Yeah. Uh, my father was Polish, and so all of his relatives were still in Poland. And I guess if you learned in the history of the Holocaust, and maybe you learn it if when you go to the PE, um, all of the Polish people, they didn't go to concentration camps when the Germans went into Poland. They took the people out of the villages and marched them into the woods and mm -hmm. made them dig their own graves and they shot them and killed them all. And so my father was from a little village and uh, I, we never found anybody. And so the Germans didn't keep records of what happened to all of the Jews in Poland. So I don't know what happened to them, but evidently that's what must, they were killed in, in a grave. To, to your knowledge, none survived. The, yeah. None of them none survived. Of them, yeah. But my mother, she was, my mother had relatives in Germany and they kept very good records and they put them in a concentration camp and all of those records are there as to what happened. And so, my, um, the relatives from my mother were in Riga and they were killed in Riga. So all of my relatives that were living in Germany during the Holocaust were all killed, so. Uh. Susan, I think we have time, maybe, I think we actually don't have time for questions, uh, unfortunately. No, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But um, we're going we're gonna to hear from Susan again in just a moment uh, to wrap up our program. Uh, when Susan's finished, she's going to go upstairs and she'll sign copies of Echoes of Memory. Um, you know, if you, if you, it, there may be a chance for some people to ask you a, cu a couple of questions yeah. at that particular time. Um, I want to thank all of you for being with us today. Uh, remind you that we will have programs each Wednesday and Thursday until the 8th of August. Um, so you can come back to another program. All our programs will be live streamed um, between now and the end of um, uh, May. And then the rest of the programs are available on the museum's YouTube channel. It's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. And so with that, I'd like to turn to Susan to close our program today. I'm going to read it to you. It's okay. It's not so very long. I want my children, my grandchildren, my brothers and their families, my friends, and the visitors here in the audience to rejoice in the fact that we are living in a democratic society and that all of us should make sure that no dictatorship would ever usurp our liberties. We need to remember the atrocities that happened to families during the Holocaust and pass this information on to our children. We need to learn from this horror in our history. We cannot undo the atrocities uh, of the past. Besides remembering, we have to take action to confront hate. When we see injustice taking place, we have to do something about it. We cannot be onlookers. We have to be sensitive to each other and we have to take care of each other. Let us celebrate what we have in common. People ask me why I volunteer in this museum. How can you do this over and over? How can I not? Giving tours to our visitors through our permanent exhibit 
hopefully teaches them what hatred and prejudice can do to people. When touring law enforcement officers and future FBI agents, I hope that they understand their role when encountering atrocities. We cannot be bystanders and definitely not be collaborators. There are threats of genocide in many parts of the world at the present time. We cannot be indifferent to emerging threats of genocide and mass atrocities. All of us need to be aware about what is happening and we need to work together and take the necessary action to prevent people from being murdered for the simple reason they are different. Never again do we uh, want to stand by and do nothing. We here at the museum want to inspire citizens and leaders worldwide to confront hatred, prevent genocide, and promote human dignity. I want to thank you, Bill Benson, for helping me tell my story. And I want to thank you, the audience, uh, for coming to our museum and being witnesses to the story of the Holocaust, Holocaust and for uh, listening to uh, my story. Now, I, I saw many of you uh, raising your hand that you're going to go to the permanent exhibit. I want to just tell you, most of my story is up on the fourth floor. Which, and, and when you get up there, as soon as you turn the corner, you're going to see uh, two SS men standing in front of a store, and they're, they're boycotting the store. Just remember my father's story there. I want you to look for that. And then also you're going to see a picture of two, police, two policemen walking a dog. One of them is an SS man, and he's wearing like a brown suit with the boots. And the other one is a civil policeman. He's wearing a, blue, a black hat, and he is wearing a blue uniform. And th that was the kind of policeman, the civil policeman, that was um, standing at the edge of the crowd. And then when you could get to um, uh, Kristallnacht, there's, a, there's a, they're like, Torahs that are strewn on the ground, and they're, they're, they're monitors that are talking about the story of Kristalna. Look at that. And then when you're stepping around the corner, you're going to be seeing a ship called uh, St. Louis, and it looks exactly like the Sapa Pinto. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else I want. I, I want you to have a wonderful learning experience. Uh, thank you again for coming and listening to my show. Thank you, Susan.